Dr. Andrew Weil is one of the world's leading voices on holistic health. He's a graduate of Harvard Medical School. He's also widely known for establishing the field of integrative medicine. If you don't know already, that's the combination of the best tenets of conventional and alternative medicine to create a more holistic treatment plan for patients. Dr. Weil is the founder and director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. He's authored 10 books that have sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. One of the cornerstones of his philosophy on better health is diet. He's recreated the food pyramid to emphasize anti-inflammatory foods, including organic fruits and vegetables. He's also a fan of seafood and healthy fats. Dr. Weil believes reducing chronic inflammation within the body can offset many health problems. I recently sat down with Dr. Andrew Weil in Washington, D.C. to get his insights on the connection between food and better health and to discuss his new role as a restaurateur. Let me, let me start off by saying uh, when I set out to get into my career, I wanted to be a broadcaster. Um, I don't think people generally wake up one morning and say, I want to be a guru, which is <laughs> what you've become. How do you get from you know, the kid to where you're sitting here today? Well, I think I've really followed my bliss and my truth. Uh, I was always a maverick. I, when I finished my medical studies, I knew that I hadn't learned how to keep people healthy. I thought there was more to medicine than what I'd been taught. And uh, I began traveling around the world and meeting other kinds of practitioners and thinking and gradually put together my own blend of, of medical theory and practice that I came to call integrative medicine. And I was just putting out what I thought was, was right. And increasingly, I got a following in the public. Talk to me about that, because initially, um, you're just this thinker and, yep. and you come up with this concept, but then you started to get like a parade of people that came forward and then the books and... Right, but interestingly for up through the first decades of my work, I had a larger and larger following in the general public, but none of my medical colleagues paid any attention to me. It was really only in the 1990s when the economics of healthcare began to sour uh, that medical colleagues and institutions began to pay attention to what I'd been saying. And now integrative medicine is really becoming a mainstream phenomenon. Uh, but there was pushback then, there's still pushback. There's still pushback and there probably always will be, but clearly this is the way of the future. This is what people want. They want medicine that's cost effective, that emphasizes health and healing, that makes use of natural therapies, not just pharmaceutical drugs. And. Um, I, it, I think what's really driving this movement now is economics because our current healthcare system is clearly not sustainable. And integrative medicine offers the promise of lowering costs while preserving or enhancing outcomes. Integrative medicine, for those who aren't familiar, the how would you The short answer is it's the intelligent combination of conventional and alternative medicine. But it's really much more than that. It's, it's medicine that's focused on the body's innate healing mechanisms that looks at people as whole persons, not just physical bodies, that looks at all aspects of lifestyle and therefore is really able to offer preventive advice, um, that values the practitioner-patient relationship, and then you know, makes use of all available methods of managing disease. Breathing, uh, meditation. Breathing, dietary adjustment, exercise, um, taking advantage of the mind-body connection as well as conventional medicine. Integrative medicine does not reject conventional medicine. No, we build on that and enlarge it. You were named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2005. How did that change your life? <laughs> uh, well, you know, our society is very celebrity driven and um, I, 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 that cuts both ways in my life. My celebrity has really enabled me to do what I do in academic medicine. You know, I, I direct a, a center of excellence at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, which trains physicians in integrative medicine. I don't think I'd have been able to do that if, you know, I had not had the, uh, the celebrity that comes with things like that. And then television appearances. Yeah. Uh, so now when you go into the airport, people are like, there he is. Yes, everybody watches what I eat, for example. <laughs> <laughs> do you eat bad every once in a while? I'm pretty good. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, I pretty much follow what I preach. Well, speaking of eating, we're in an eating establishment. Yeah. Um, 
It, it's interesting you say you follow your bliss, but somehow you followed into the restaurant business, which I suspect it was not on your agenda early on. How'd that come about? I'm a very good home cook. Uh, and over the years, many people who have eaten my food have said, you know, you ought to open a restaurant. I was smart enough to know that I knew nothing about the restaurant business and it looked like a very tough business, so I was never tempted by that. But uh, about seven, eight years ago, I was introduced to a very successful restaurateur, Sam Fox in Arizona, and I proposed to him the concept of a new kind of restaurant that would bring together the worlds of good nutrition and fine dining. He didn't get it. He said, health food doesn't sell. And I think he thought I meant tofu and sprouts. Uh, so I invited him and his wife to my home. I cooked for them. He liked the food. His wheels began turning. And he said he was willing to try it, but he was very skeptical. So we opened this first one in Phoenix about six years ago, just as the economy tanked. And uh, from That's the, always good. Yeah, always good. <laughs> from the moment it opened its doors, it was, it was a stunning success. And Sam initially said, well, can't tell anything about a new restaurant because everybody's going to come. But after six months, he said he'd never seen anything like this. He'd never had people come up on the street and hug him for opening a restaurant. He'd never had people from all over the country begging him to open one of these. Uh, he'd never had a restaurant where people would come in and eat dinner four and five times a week, the same people. So I think we've hit on a, a really good concept that people like. And it's been great fun for me. I, I do not have to do much on the business side. You know, I get to design menus and create recipes and oversee the food philosophy, and that's, for me, the fun part. What about China or, or spreading outside the United Actually, States? we've had requests to open um, these in Canada, in China, in Japan, uh, in Dubai, but I think for the moment our focus is on the U.S., and uh, you know we want to get up to a certain number of restaurants here, but then then you, I would be certainly open to looking at foreign markets. Let's talk about some of the stuff that you uh, talk about. Chronic inflammation. Can you talk to us about what that is and what yeah. it can produce? We all know inflammation on the surface of the body. It's local redness, heat, swelling, and pain in an area that's been injured or under attack. And inflammation is the cornerstone of the body's healing response. It's how the body gets more nourishment and more immune activity to an area that needs it. But inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it stay where it's supposed to stay and end when it's supposed to end. If inflammation persists, if it serves no purpose, it becomes productive of disease. And it now looks, and this is a relatively new idea in medicine, that chronic low-level imperceptible inflammation is the root cause of all of the major diseases of aging, things like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, even cancer. Um, and therefore, containing inappropriate inflammation seems to be the best overall strategy for maximum longevity and health. There are a lot of influences on inflammation, uh, genetics, stress, exposure to environmental toxins, but diet has a huge influence. And I think there's no question that the mainstream diet in North America favors inflammation. It gives us the wrong kinds of fats, the wrong kinds of carbohydrates, and not enough of the protective elements that are found mostly in fruits and vegetables and herbs and spices. So I designed about 10, 12 years ago an anti-inflammatory diet. I based it on the Mediterranean diet because we have very strong scientific evidence that that's the way of eating that's best correlated with overall general health and longevity. But I tweaked that to make it more powerful by adding Asian influences. I've spent a lot of time in Asia and familiar with Asian ingredients. Um, so I've come up with this anti-inflammatory diet and anti-inflammatory diet pyramid, and that really is the basis of the menu that's at True Food Kitchen. Uh, you had taught earlier about some of the criticism, and, and, and we do have kind of a silo-based medical profession yep. where you might be in one silo and, and the others are. But one critic wrote this about you, and I wanted to get your thoughts on sure. it, and I'm sure you've heard all the criticism, yeah. so this won't come as a surprise. He looks like an aging 1960s rock star. <laughs> He's quite charismatic. No physician that I can think of has over the course of his life done, lifetime done more to promote the rise of quack emetic <laughs> medicine. Um, when they say quack or quack emetic, um, it has to sting, doesn't it? No, because I know that what I do is right and based in, in scientific evidence. First of all, 
a, gr a great deal that's done in conventional medicine does not have a good scientific evidence base. Uh, secondly, a, a, statements like that are really ignorant because a lot of um, what is dismissed as quackery in fact has very strong evidence. For instance, I'm trained as a botanist as well as a physician and medical botany is one of my career interests. There's an awful lot of good scientific evidence for the efficacy and safety of many plant medicines. And this is all dismissed you know, in one sentence by people like this. I saw an article recently in which all of Chinese medicine was equated with uh, crystal healing. That's just ignorant, you know, that Chinese medicine includes acupuncture, which has been validated for conditions like um, uh, back pain, and it also includes very sophisticated herbal treatments. Um, in many cases, these plants produce effects for which we don't have pharmaceutical drugs. You, tell me about uh, your thoughts on traditional Chinese medicine, because you just talked a little bit on it. Uh, there are a, a lot of people who are, are turning to that as well, and, and for many of the reasons you just said. It's made great inroads in our culture, and I think it's a mixture of, of ideas and practices that are sensible and some that aren't. But I'll tell you one, one aspect of Chinese medical philosophy that I find very appealing. I have a colleague in New York, uh, Dr. Zhang, who's tra trained in China as an MD, very smart man. And I had him out to Arizona to lecture to our physicians. And he said that if you could summarize all of Chinese medical philosophy in one sentence, it would be to dispel evil and support the good. Western medicine's whole thrust is on dispelling evil. You know, we identify germs and develop weapons against germs. We do very little to support the good, which is the body's natural defense mechanisms, its natural resistance. So I think both of those approaches are necessary. And uh, to me, an integration of that Chinese and Western philosophy produces the best medicine. Fruits and veggies, you're a big proponent of those, but you also say you should take the supplements. If I get enough, why do I need them? That's a good question. I mean, I think ideally, if you're, if you're eating a balanced diet every day, you should be able to cover all your nutritional bases. But, you know, I grow a lot of my own food. I'm a very careful shopper. I cook for myself. And I take a daily multivitamin, multimineral supplement because there are days like two days ago when I traveled here from Arizona when for one reason or another, I, I don't eat the fruits and vegetables that I should be eating. So I think that these things can be useful as insurance against gaps in the diet. And some, like vitamin D, um, I think have specific therapeutic or preventive effects that you really can't get enough from the diet. How many marriages do you think you've impacted? Because I already pointed <laughs> out to you, my wife gets an email from yeah. you every day. She's walking around in your <laughs> shoes. She's telling me how to live my life. Well, it's interesting. You know, women really have been the leaders in this movement. Um, they're, they're the greatest readers of health magazines, they're the chief buyers of books on health. One interesting phenomenon is that in our, you know, we, our center offers two-year intensive fellowships to doctors who want to get up to speed in all the things they didn't learn in medical school. A lot of them have been sent there by their wives <laughs> who read my books and told them they have to go. You, know, you send her a note medicine. one of these days saying, yeah. I'm okay, I'm, I'm trying to stay yeah. good. Um, if I were to... Uh, go to the store and buy essentials, uh, and you were to make out my shopping list for me, what should I have in my kitchen? Well, first of all, what you should not have, you really want to try to not have refined, processed, and manufactured food. That's really the source of all the trouble. I'd say you want to have good extra virgin olive oil. You want to have a variety of, of herbs and spices, certainly garlic, which is a nutritional powerhouse. Um, you want to have good quality produce, um, I'm a great believer in eating greens of one sort or another, whether it's kale or spinach or collards. I think these are very good to have. I think it's good to have oily fish in the diet, which are sources of omega-3 fatty acids. And very inexpensive ones you can get in any supermarket are sardines or, or smoked kippers in cans. They're cheap. They're very good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. You like Asian mushrooms too? I love Asian mushrooms. Uh, you know, this is everything shiitake, maitake, nokis, oyster mushrooms. These have um, many unique medicinal properties. They lower cholesterol, they help our bodies fight infection, and they increase our defenses against cancer. Will you take us on a little tour of your kitchen? Sure. All right. Thanks so much.
Okay, so we've transitioned into the kitchen, and there's a, it's busy here, it's yep. busy out here, I might add, as well. What are you going to make for us? Well, one of our signature dishes is Tuscan kale salad. Sounds good. Uh, this is black kale. It's an Italian heirloom variety. Wow. Easily gettable. So you remove the stalks on this. It's been chopped up. And now I'm going to put over this a dressing that's extra virgin olive oil, fresh lemon juice, oh, wow. salt, red pepper flakes, that's and good. garlic. Now the secret of this salad is that the leaves have to sit in the dressing ideally for 30 minutes and the salt and lemon juice soften the kale and take the bitterness out of it. If you just try to eat raw kale, it's not so pleasant. So, <laughs> so, you, so you have to experiment to yeah. get to this stage, I guess. So you want to then I would say normally let it sit now for 30 minutes and then to this we put on a sprinkling of toasted breadcrumbs and some uh, grated Parmesan. And that's our salad, but you know, you won't, you're not gonna like it so much right now because it hasn't, well, I'll get you some finish to try, but you can take a, take oh, a bite. I'll take a little okay. shot at it. Uh, you've already prepped me, it may not be the best thing. Let me ask you about uh, eating practices. I know you said Mediterranean, you like that style. Yes. Um, the American style of diet, I mean, it, you just look around, it seems everybody's obese. Well, it, the, the huge problem is the, that most people are eating great amounts of refined, processed, and manufactured food. That's that's the big change that's happened in our culture. What about uh, moving from Mediterranean? Any other uh, healthy uh, diet? Well, I'm a big fan of, of Asian cooking. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Japan. I think Japanese food is very healthy. Chinese food, if it's well prepared, Vietnamese food, all of that. So you like it even I though I know it you warned me, but yeah. that tastes very, very good. Okay, good. I'll even go in for another bite. That was all right. right. <laughs> um, how often do you put this together? This isn't very complicated, is it? It's easy, and it's yeah. something that a home cook can do. And one of the other advantages of this is that it'll keep, you can keep this for several days in the refrigerator, so you can make a large quantity, and it remains good. So I may take it with me. Yes, now, please let do. Let me put this back. It's been a delight. Pleasure. Thank Pleasure you so much. Really good. appreciate it. We'll be back in just a moment. It's good stuff.